Welcome back to The Great Adventure, Pediatric Pulmonary Physiology. This is the ninth uh, presentation in the series, and we're going to be talking about pulmonary function testing one, and this is an introduction. I just want to preface this by saying that this is the advanced course. So we're going to be talking about not only interpretation of pulmonary function testing, but how tests are performed. So there's some introductory information that you need to know before we specifically go into pulmonary function testing, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So this is The Great Adventure, and this is the ninth in the series. And so to remind you, when we talked about pulmonary mechanics, there are only two things really that alter the distribution of ventilation within the lungs. Areas of lung where there's decreased distensibility, and areas of lung where there is airway obstruction. Today, we're gonna to talk about indications, effort and ability with respect to pulmonary function testing, gas laws and correction, and normal predicted values. So indications, effort and ability. In the ideal world, if we had patients that lose some amount of actual physiologic function, we would like to be able to detect that. So if somebody has only 75% of, let's say, lung function, we would like to be able to measure that and show that they in fact have lost 75 percent. This would be the ideal clinical situation, but it does not occur in, in actual practice. So if we look at clinical observation, for example, typical history, physical examination, chest x-ray, etc., it turns out that somebody can lose a lot of physiologic function before we can start to detect a fall. So that curve would look something like this, and it's very different than the ideal uh, observation. So pulmonary function testing improves our ability to assess actual physiologic function. So this curve might look something like this, where basically, again, one can lose some physiologic function without us being able to detect it, but we can start to detect the fall in function earlier than and more accurately uh, than we can with clinical observation alone. In pulmonary medicine, we can measure physiology in real patients. Pulmonary function testing describes how physiologic function is compromised by lung disease. There are objective measures which can be quantitated, and it's the most sensitive indication of the presence of lung disease or change in lung disease. Generally speaking, we perform pulmonary function testing to assess general respiratory health, to assess the effects of disease on lung function, to assess airway responsiveness, to monitor disease course or therapeutic intervention, to assess preoperative risk and to determine prognosis. We use pulmonary function testing to address one or more of these questions in individual patients. This is a classical spirometer, which is the basis of pulmonary function testing as we'll describe. So spirometers, at least classically, before the computer era, were basically a tube was connected to a bell. Uh, the bell could go up and down. If somebody exhales into the bell, it goes up and this uh, basically uh, records on a pen a downward sort of uh, slope, which is exhalation. If the person inhales through the bell, the bell goes down, and on the recorder, it goes up, including indicating inhalation. Classically, this was a water-sealed sort of thing. So there's a tank here, there's the bell, and there's water around to prevent leak of gas around this. And this is what a spirogram would look like. Someone breathes in and out normally, takes a deep breath all the way in, and then exhales, in this case forcibly, all the way out, and then perhaps breathes again. So this can be obtained from a classical spirometer. If we wanted to look at more um, in-depth gas exchange before the computer era, we could only collect exhaled gas. So someone would breathe through a one-way valve, in this way, breathe in, and then when they breathe out, the air would be collected and then sampled, in this case, in a Douglas bag, which could be up to 60 liters, 60 liters. Um, here's an example of using this during an exercise stress test. So as opposed to being able to calculate um, things instantaneously as with the computer, we could only calculate stages of gas exchange. Generally speaking, the tradition was three minutes worth. Here's another example. This is a TSO spirometer, which is a 100 liter spirometer, and again, one could collect exhaled gas using that. In terms of measuring pulmonary mechanics, we measure pressure, first of all, using a differential pressure transducer. So one can connect something to this side, something to this side, 
If the pressure here is greater, it will deflect this membrane, which has an electrical circuit in it, and basically the deflection is proportional to an electrical output, which actually is proportional to that difference. So that's a differential pressure transducer. Resistance equals change in pressure over flow, remember, in a tube. So we can reconfigure flow equals change in pressure over resistance. Well, this device is called a Mimitac. And basically, one has a fixed resistance. One can measure pressure before and after the resistance. Flow is going this direction. And therefore, flow is going to be proportional to this pressure difference because the resistance is constant. So that's how flow is measured. With computers, volume is the integral of flow. Before computers, we used spirometers and exhaled gas collection. But now we can measure flow directly using that pneumatech. And this is calibrated with a three liter syringe. So this is a very finely calibrated three liter syringe. And if we put all the air through the pneumatech and then integrate that flow, it should equal the volume. And so that's exactly how we do it. Here's an example of pulmonary function tech actually calibrating the pneumatech by introducing this finely calibrated three liters of air through that pneumatech. And then the integrated flow should equal three liters. So computer pulmonary function testing systems measure flow with a pneumatech. The computer integrates flow to give volume, and the system is calibrated with a 3-liter syringe, plus or minus 0.05% is acceptable. If flow is measured accurately, integration will give a volume of 3 liters, and acceptable RSR is, is plus or minus 3%. This should be performed daily uh, in a pulmonary function lab, or more often if conditions vary. A biologic control that is a healthy non-smoking person capable of reproducible PFTs should also be used. And this can be used, um, but not instead of daily calibration procedures. So at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, we repeat PFTs on our standard subject monthly. And assuming this person has not had a change in their uh, lungs by disease, for example, this should be consistent month to month. Testing conditions are important. Pulmonary function testing should be done in a quiet, comfortable environment. Drinking water, tissues, paper towels should be available. The subject should be seated erect, shoulders slightly back, and chin elevated. Chair should have arms and a height adjustment, but not on wheels. Feet should be flat on the floor. And there's little difference, it turns out, between standing and seated pulmonary function testing. So most people do this in the seated position. Pulmonary function testing requires the ability and willingness of the subject to perform breathe specific breathing maneuvers. For example, they need to be able to take a full inspiration, exhale forcibly, and continue exhaling until no air is left. Generally speaking, this is possible for otherwise normal adults and children above six years of age. It's not possible to obtain pulmonary function testing if patients cannot cooperate. In our laboratory, the technicians assess both effort and ability. Why both? Well, historically, our pulmonary function tests gave credit for effort. That is, he tried hard, even if his ability was poor. So now I ask the techs in our laboratory to assess both, and they rely on the technician's assessment. There should be no premature termination on the maximum extra flow volume curve, and an achieved plateau in the time volume curve should have less than 0.025 liter change or 25 ml change in the last second of exhalation. And we'll show you these. So premature termination of a forced vital capacity maneuver, this would be an acceptable flow volume curve. Here, the subject stopped early and there was a premature termination indicated by this drop. Here's another example. Uh, in fact, both pre and post bronchodilators, this patient, dropped off. Um, so ordinarily, this would be expected to go out much further. With respect to the time volume curve, so this is volume over time, the last portion of this, last second or so, should uh, be flat. That is, there should be less than a 25 ml difference over the course of a second. It used to be that ATS requirements, American Thrash Society requirements, um, required a six second exhalation. That's no longer part of the requirement. Rather, the requirement is that the curve is flat for the last second or so. As mentioned, forced expiratory time is no longer a requirement for an acceptable forced vital capacity maneuver. 
more than 95% of subjects who exhaled for greater than six seconds achieved an acceptable plateau. Only 18% of healthy children, however, aged 10 to 18, were able to meet the forced expiratory time criteria, but they were able to achieve an acceptable plateau. So six seconds is no longer the requirement. And this would be an example of an acceptable forced expiratory plateau. You can see this person exhaled, and there really is no change in volume here over the last several seconds in this curve. This would be an example of an unacceptable curve. Here you can see this person never achieves a flat plateau, but continues to change the whole time during exhalation. So we're not sure if this is this person's maximum or not. Two more examples. Similarly, uh, this person never achieves an acceptable plateau, so this would not be uh, an acceptable force vital capacity maneuver. Activities which should be avoided before pulmonary function testing. Smoke, smoking, vaping, water pipe use, etc. within an hour. Consuming intoxicants within eight hours. Performing vigorous exercise within one hour and wearing clothing that restricts thoracic or abdominal motion. These should be avoided. Medications should be avoided before PFTs. So whether to or not to withhold inhaled short acting or long acting bronchodilators depends on the purpose of testing. First time pulmonary function tests or to assess bronchodilator response, inhaled bronchodilators and anticholinergics should be withheld. To assess the response to treatment, one may wish to study subjects on their chronic medications. If one wants to avoid medicines before, these are the medications in the times. Short acting beta agonists uh, should be withheld four to six hours prior to testing. Longer acting or short acting agents uh, that are different, such as ipratropium uh, and a cholinergic, should be withheld 12 hours before testing. Long acting beta agonists should be held for, withheld for 24 hours, and ultra long acting beta agonists for 36 hours. Long acting uh, medications in this variety 36 to 48 hours. So depending on the medication involved, uh, they do need to be held. The most common is short acting beta agonists, which need to be held withheld for four to six hours prior to testing. So contraindications of pulmonary function testing. Pulmonary function testing can be physically demanding. The forced expiratory maneuver increases intrathoracic and intracranial pressures, and the potential risks of spirometry are primarily related to maximal pressures generated in the thorax and its impact on abdominal organs, venous return, and systemic blood pressure. Specific contraindications. Um, in terms of increasing myocardial demand or blood pressure, a myocardial infarction within a week, systemic hypotension or severe hypertension, atrial or ventricular arrhythmias, non-compensated heart failure, uncontrolled pulmonary hypertension, clinically unstable pulmonary embolus, and a history of syncope related to forced exhalation or cough. In terms of things that increase intracranial or intraocular pressure, cerebral aneurysms, brain surgery within four weeks, recurrent concussion with continuing symptoms, and eye surgery within one week. In terms of what can increase sinus or middle ear pressures, sinus surgery, middle ear surgery, or infection within one week. In terms of the increase in intrathoracic or intra-abdominal pressure, pneumothoraces should be completely resolved for two weeks prior to testing. Thoracic surgery, uh, none within four weeks. Abdominal surgery, none within four weeks. And late-term pregnancies would be considered a contraindication. Infection control issues, active or suspected transmissible respiratory or systemic uh, infection, especially tuberculosis. Amoptosis, significant secretions, oral secretions, or oral bleeding, all are contraindications as well. PFTs actually are safe. A 20-year review of 186,000 routine pulmonary function tests found the safety uh, concerns incidents occurred in only five out of every 10,000 PFTs. Syncope was the most common event. 10% of patients doing cardiopulmonary exercise testing had simple self-limited arrhythmias during spirometry. There were no adverse events in 519 thoracic aneurysm patients doing spirometry, and therefore pulmonary function tests generally have a low risk of harm. All right, let's move to gas laws and correction. Now, we often don't think about this because computers do it for you, but you should at least be aware of these issues. 
Evangelista Torricelli said, we live submerged at the bottom of an ocean of the element air, which by unquestioned experiments is known to have weight. In the 1600s, he said. So dry gas laws, Boyle's law, Charles law, and Dalton's law of partial pressure are dry gas laws. Water vapor does not act like dry gases. Therefore, water vapor pressure must be subtracted from barometric pressure. Water vapor pressure varies by temperature, and it is 47 torr of millimeters of mercury at 37 degrees Celsius or 310 degrees Kelvin. So this is a water vapor correction, and you can see that it varies by different room temperatures. We are generally interested in water vapor at body temperature because we're interested in lung lines, flows, etc., in the lungs, in the, uh, in the body at 37 degrees Celsius. Boyle's law, useful in the body box. Basically, for a sealed gas, a pressure times volume equals a constant. So if we compress the volume, we're going to increase the pressure of this gas. That's Boyle's law. Charles' law shows the temperature that volume varies by temperature. So if I have a sealed amount of gas and I heat it, both the temperature and volume will increase proportionately. Note that the temperature used to measure this is in degrees Kelvin, which is Celsius plus 273 degrees. So lung volumes and flow rates are measured in a spirometer at room temperature, which is ambient temperature pressure saturated. And we want to know the volume and flows at body temperature, which is body temperature pressure saturated. Note again, temperature is in degrees Kelvin, which is Celsius plus 273. So the spirometers, of course, are general at room temperature. So ambient temperature pressure saturated ATPS is what's measured in the spirometer. Body temperature pressure saturated is what's measured in the body. Prior to the computer era, all pulmonary function labs had so-called BTPS correction charts. The factor that you need to multiply volumes and flow rates by in order to get them to what they would be at body temperature pressure saturated. The most common was a room temperature around 24 degrees Celsius, and the BTPS factor was 1.080. So if you measured a vital capacity of one liter, for example, then that same volume measured in the room would be 1.080 uh, liters in the body. Same for flow rates. For most computerized pulmonary function system, systems that use pneumatax, Inspired air is assumed to be at ATPS. Expired air is assumed to be at BTPS, body temperature pressure. Or looked at this way, inspired air coming from the outside is ATPS and it needs a BTPS correction. Exhaled air is at body temperature, so it does not need a BTPS correction. All lung volumes and extra flow rates are corrected to BTPS, body temperature pressure saturated. When we want to know the absolute number of molecules, then we correct to STPD, standard temperature pressure dry. And this is a barometric pressure of 760 torr and a temperature of zero degrees Celsius or 273 degrees Kelvin. So this would be the formula. If we have our volume at, at uh, STPD that we want to know, it's going to be 760 divided by temperature. And what we've measured is a volume at HPS what the real barometric pressure is and what the room temperature is. And so STPD would give us basically this formula to calculate from ATPS. To correct for pulmonary function then, flows and volumes, we want to correct to body temperature pressure saturated. So that's all the lung volumes and all the flow rates. For the pulmonary function test where we want to know the actual number of molecules, how much oxygen diffused across the alveolar capillary membrane, how much oxygen was consumed or CO2 produced. These then are corrected to standard temperature pressure dry or STPD. So only these four parameters are measured to STPD. Everything else is measured to body temperature pressure saturated. So let's now talk about normal predicted values. So in order to be able to interpret pulmonary function testing, we need to know how an individual's pulmonary function basically uh, measures up against a predicted normal for a similar type individual. So John Hutchinson in the 1800s 
was considered the inventor of the spirometer. And he originally measured lung function in 4,000 individuals. He noted that there was a large variation in vital capacity measurements. And he discovered that vital capacity varied primarily by height. He also characterized these particular volumes. Inspiratory reserve volume at the end of a normal breath to full inspiration. Tidal volume, which is your uh, breath on each uh, breath while breathing. Extra reserve volume, what you exhale. And postulated a residual air um, left in the lungs at the end of this, although he could not measure that. So patients have different sized lungs. Pulmonary function values, therefore, are compared against predicted normal values based on individuals of the same age, gender, and height. For most pulmonary function parameters, the normal range is around 80% predicted to 120% predicted. It's a fairly wide uh, range there. These are the Children's Hospital Los Angeles normal predicted values that have been used for uh, quite some time. And you can see that most of these are in that range of 80 to 120% roughly. Um, they are somewhat different, but uh, they're pretty close. These are absolute ratios here. And this is a, a different sort of measure. These are different measures. So in the pulmonary function printout that we have here at Children's Hospital of Sciences, we have the parameters. We have a reference value, which is the predicted value based again on age, height, and gender. We have the measured value, in this case, prior to bronchodilator. That's then calculated as a percent predicted. And then based on a global lung initiative, we have a lower limit of normal and upper limit of normal, which is written here for you as well. So this gives you an idea then, with your patient, how are they doing with reference to the predicted normal for an individual of the same, again, age, height, and gender. So as mentioned, for most pulmonary function parameters, the normal range is 80% to 100% predicted. This is really a wide range. So what causes such a wide range? for predicted normal PFTs. So factors that may influence lung function would be tobacco smoking or vaping, secondhand tobacco smoke exposure or vaping as a child, air pollution, whether or not somebody had childhood lung diseases, race or ethnicity, and occupational exposure, either primary or secondhand. There are some conditions here. So for scoliosis, for example, we do a normal predict that's not based on height because scoliosis is actually going to shrink an in individual's height. So we do it based on arm span. Turns out that curvature of the spine with scoliosis decreases vertical thoracic height. This decreases lung volume. The more severe the scoliosis curve, the greater the loss of lung volume. But you want to compare the measured lung volume to that a person would have um, without scoliosis. Remember, lung volumes correlate with height, age, and gender. Height is diminished in scoliosis, so you can't use that to predict lung volumes. But arm span nearly equals height in normal individuals. So we use arm span instead of height to predict lung volumes in scoliosis. And here's the data. The Maastricht study of healthy children, 2,595 2, Caucasian children, note Caucasian, age 2 to 17, roughly half male, Arm span nearly equals height in these subjects. So arm span equals 1.0084 times height minus 1.8. Obviously cannot use this in short limb dwarf anomalies. And here's the data just to show you for both males and females, arm span versus height. You can see a nice correlation there. Arm span divided by height for boys. Uh, again, uh, one here is the, is the range 1.0, 1.02. For girls, similar sort of thing, right around one. So this is, in fact, a good measure um, or surrogate for height in people with scoliosis. So as we've said, so we use arm span instead of height to predict lung volumes and scoliosis. So in this case, they're almost would be the same age, gender, and arm span. Most laboratories, including our own, now use the Global Lung Health Lung Function Initiative, or GLI, for predicted normal values. In 2008, this network pooled and collated existing spirometry data from human controls derived from all ages and ethnicities. Data came from 72 centers in 33 countries, and there were a total of 97,000 individuals 
aged 3 to 95, and they were all healthy non-smokers, about 50% female. Race correction for Caucasian, African American, Northern Asian, and Southern Asian were also included. We'll get back to that. So this shows uh, plotted the lower limit of normal we predicted for FEV1, uh, FEC, FEV, and for both males and females. And uh, you can see that uh, the lower limit of normal is around 80%, okay? For the children we would be measuring in our pulmonary function lab up till about age 40, and then it falls off. So older individuals can actually have lower FEV1s or FECs, which are still in the normal range for those ages. It's a beauty of the GLI that it was able to detect this. Here's another normal predicted value for 28,000 females, and again, lower limit of normal for FEV1 uh, versus 80% predicted. So you'll note that if you use 80% predicted as lower limit of normal in older individuals, it starts to deviate from what the actual value is. It's actually not bad in the childhood range. One of the problems with normal predicted values prior to GLI is that there was a separate regression for childhood pulmonary function and adult pulmonary function. So people that were in this range where these two got together, the normal predicted value was actually much higher than the actual value. So the nice thing about GLI is that its curve basically is a more accurate reflection, especially in this age. Here, you would have had lung function that abruptly dropped in its percent predicted. And unfortunately, when you move to this to this, even if the lung volumes are the same, uh, the percent predicted could be different. This is avoided in GLI. This just shows you a number of values for the race correction. So a Caucasian is up here. Note that African Americans consistently are below um, these curves. And this shows us again the predictive values and the lower limit of, uh, of normal. So these curves are to some extent different. And the percent different in mean PFTs compared to European Americans for African Americans, FE1 is about 14 to 15% lower, right? FEC likewise. F1 over FEC is a little bit lower, would be acceptable. And if you're 25, 75, again, about 12 to 13 percent. The values are not so bad for Northeast Asians and Southeast Asians, but again, there are some differences. So what, what we have here is the predicted values for the different races, but these are the actual values. Look at the scatter for white women. The scatter for normal individuals more than encompasses this area, which suggests that there may be some unrealistic aspects to trying to define these differences because the scatter within a single a racial ethnic group is so large. Even with racial ethnic groups, pulmonary function tests can vary by geographic region. So McGarry and her colleagues did a study of 1,433 Hispanic CF patients compared to 13,499 non-Hispanic white CF patients, age 6 to 25, roughly half male, and uh, these parameters, FEC, FEV1, FEV1, or FEC, and FEF2575, were analyzed in the West, Midwest, Northeast, and South US. And here's what you found. There were differences. This shows non-Hispanic white minus Hispanic white PFT parameters as percent predicted. And you can see that in the West, the uh, non-Hispanic white was almost eight percent predicted points higher than Hispanics. This was not true in other areas. For FE1 over FEC, there was no change. So this is basically what is shown here. So the FEC difference is greatest in the West, uh, a little bit greater in the Northeast and Midwest, and then least down in the South. Similarly for FEV1, the, the measures were the greatest in the West. Uh, in this case, a little bit more in the, in the South and the Northeast, and then least in the Midwest. This is uh, FF 2575, same sort of pattern here. Even within racial ethnic groups, PFTs varied by geographic reach. Pulmonary function uh, disparity is worse for Hispanics in the West than anywhere else in the US. Race ethnicity PFT correction does not account 
for geographical differences within a racial or ethnic group. Should we correct PFTs for race and ethnicity? So John Hutchinson again, who was the founder of spirometry, compared vital capacity between occupations. So he had police, soldiers, artists, paupers, and gentlemen. Note he did not test on women. And he thought that race ethnicity was not thought to be relevant. So he didn't break down his subjects by that. This is similar sort of data in this case of American soldiers. But in this case, it was broken down by race ethnicity. So white soldiers, okay, full blacks, mulattoes, and Indians. And you can see that there were some differences in the cubic inches in this case, in the values of these measurements. So this is uh, average capacity of lung or vital capacity. And so this was noted. And so in the US, lung volumes were found to be lower in blacks. Decreased lung volume was used to validate that blacks were inferior to whites, and it was used to justify slavery. It was suggested that blacks were healthier in slavery than they were uh, if they were free. Uh, this quote from 1877, should the black man die out in the end, as he probably will, of weak lungs and for want of congenial air in the more elevated region to which he has been raised and to which he cannot be acclimated, let it not be recorded that it is due to bad treatment on our part. So again, using decreased lung function to suggest that blacks were inferior. So in Britain, the spirometer was used as a tool to monitor the efficiency of industrial labor. In the United States, the spirometer became a tool for marking racial difference and inadequacy for industrial labor. So should we correct PFTs for race and ethnicity when we do not correct for tobacco smoke or vaping, secondhand tobacco smoke exposure to a child, air pollution, childhood lung diseases, atopy, occupational exposure, either primary or secondary and other factors that might affect lung function. Correcting PFTs for race or ethnicity has unintended racism consequences. Adjusting African-American normal PFTs to 10 to 15 percent lower misses disease, results in less treatment, and makes it more difficult for them to qualify for disability or for other things like maybe um, medical interventions, transplantation, etc. Adjusting African-American normal PFTs value 10% lower means that some disease will be called normal. Diseases are not detected in the African-Americans that would have been in white, and therefore they are treated less for disease than white. So it's been known that African-Americans receive less treatment for disease than whites. So why are African-American PFT value 10 to 15% lower? Is it biologic? The socioeconomic disadvantage decreased growth on lung volumes. There seems to be no biologic basis for race correction, and it can cause harm. There are a number of problems. One, race ethnicity is difficult to define. It does not capture environmental influences on lung function. It is not a proxy for genetic factors. It may bias inclusion in clinical trials. It may perpetuate health disparities. It's a social political construct that supports structural racism. Delayed diagnosis and withheld treatment in non white populations may obviously uh, result in more severe disease and reduced access to health care. The problems with no race correction is that one might overdiagnose non whites so that unnecessary testing or treatments with potential side effects might occur. Non whites might be ineligible for certain occupations firefighters, pilots, commercial divers, minors, etc. Withholding certain treatment in non-whites like chemotherapy, lung cancer resection, bone marrow transplant, lung transplant, etc. And higher life or health insurance premiums in non-whites. Race ethnicity correction may miss disease by accepting lower PFTs as normal. And therefore, non-Caucasians may be undertreated. Using no race ethnicity correction, we may call disease by accepting higher PFT values as normal, and non Caucasians may be overtreated. Does race ethnicity correction of PFTs improve prediction of serious respiratory infection or death? P 
PFTs are used to diagnose physiologic type of lung disease, follow disease progression, monitor treatment efficacy, and predict outcomes or need for intervention. PFTs may predict high-risk lung disease groups for serious infections and mortality. So do or does race ethnicity correction improve prediction of serious respiratory infections? So this is a population-based prospective cohort study of white, black, Hispanic, and Asian adults. There were 3,300 subjects age 65 plus or minus 10, 50% female, and you can see the proportion, uh, mostly whites, but significant number of blacks, Hispanics, and Asians. So the percent predicted values were calculated for FVC and FVV1 for all groups using GLI race ethnicity corrected norms versus race, ethn race ethnicity neutral norms, i.e. the GLI other category. And they wanted to predict chronic lower respiratory disease events defined as hospitalization or death due to lung disease and all cause mortality compared between the race ethnicity norms and neutral norms over nearly 12 years. So these really show pulmonary function results for the specific racial ethnic groups. And uh, the solid lines are race ethnicity based spirometry. The dashed lines are race ethnicity neutral values. So you can see uh, there are some differences here. Now, the proportion of total subjects in this study who had respiratory events okay, in the blue bars, and who died from any cause in the red bars, as you can see, are, are shown here. And, you know, they look relatively similar across uh, all the racial groups. The PFTs predicting a racial groups, as you can see, for each of these groups, predicting lung disease-related events or deaths in the top and um, on the bottom for uh, males and females. So what, what you can see here is that there's actually a fair amount of overlap between the um, normal values predicted by the race ethnicity corrected group versus not. All right, so they're not real significantly different in that respect. These are the ones producing mortality. And again, you can see that there is a fair amount of overlap. Race ethnicity corrected PFTs did not predict chronic lung disease related events or mortality better than neutral PFTs. Lower PFTs do predict lung disease related events and mortality, but race ethnicity correction does not improve this prediction. Assigning race is inconsistent, not standardized, and so basically race ethnicity correction underdiagnoses disease in non-whites. This was another study looking again at uh, about 5,000 whites uh, almost 4,000 blacks, age 20 to 80, roughly half female, and mortality was increased 1.46 times in blacks. So prediction of mortality using race-based PFT prediction equation versus race neutral, does race correction improve prediction of mortality? Basically what we have here is race ethnicity correction for PFTs. And so this shows for whites and blacks, the FEC, and these are corrected now. So you can see that these are all pretty similar for FEC as a percent predicted uh, using white equations, using race corrected equations. So obviously a difference is shown here. This is the absolute values. So if we look at subjects lower limit of normal using these equations, okay? So again, for whites and blacks, using basically white equations or no correction, the blacks have a higher percent of patients below the lower limit of normal. Using race correction, they don't. But remember that blacks had a higher mortality. So using the white equations, white versus black hazard ratios based on lung function, right? Corrected for lung function was equal. If they used race specific equations, then the blacks appeared to have a higher mortality even for the same degree of lung function. Again, race neutral basically shows equivalent mortality corrected for lung function, which in fact is the uh, correct biologic situation. So low lung function in blacks helped explain overall higher mortality. Black and white subjects at the same age, sex height, and force vital capacity the same mortality. And this was accurately reflected in race neutral uh, PFT predicted and uh, race specific PFT prediction equation overestimate mortality in blacks. So race specific PFT prediction 
equations do not accurately predict mortality. Using race ethnicity correction assumes decreased lung function in blacks is not clinically meaningful. If lower lung function in blacks compared to whites is normal, then use of race ethnicity correction would yield a similar risk for mortality across races. Use of race ethnicity neutral equations would overestimate mortality in blacks. And of course, that was, is what was seen in the previous study. All right here was another study looking at, again, almost 9,000 whites and almost 4,000 blacks. You can see the age is roughly equal, uh, gender roughly equal, uh, deaths in the group. Um, more or less proportional to the total number, mortality rate very similar, uh, and these are the lung function parameters. So this shows race ethnicity FEV1 by Z scores, and this is predicted survival. And you can see that the predicted survival is less using the corrected, race corrected predicted values. So using race ethnicity neutral equation predicts similar mortality between groups which are matched for age, sex, height height and lung function. These results suggest that using race ethnicity correction reinforces a false assumption that lower lung function is normal in blacks and it does not have health implications. Race ethnicity correction may obscure true causes of disparity, reducing the likelihood that modifiable risk factors are identified and acted on. A couple other problems. Self-reported race ethnicity is inaccurate and does not reflect genetic differences. Much more variation is due to non-race ethnicity factors. Race ethnicity correction does not improve prediction of morbidity or mortality. Decreased PFT in blacks is not normal, but likely reflects true decreased function. And race ethnicity correction results in undertreatment and diagnosis of non-whites. We do not correct pulmonary function tests for race or ethnicity in the Children's Hospital Los Angeles Pulmonary Physiology Laboratory. To kind of summarize this point in time, we're looking at uh, abnormal pulmonary function patterns, which are basically going to be decreased distensibility and airway obstruction. So let's summarize what we've learned. One must assess effort and ability before interpreting PFTs. Lung volume and flow measurements need to be corrected for temperature. Normal predicted values have a wide range, which may be due to many influences. For scoliosis, arm span equals height. Race ethnicity correction is no more valid than correcting for environmental exposure or childhood disease. Race ethnicity correction does not predict morbidity or mortality any better than race neutral. Decreased PFTs in blacks is not normal, but likely reflects true decreased function. And race ethnicity correction results in undertreatment and diagnosis in non-whites. So next time, we'll delve into pulmonary function testing a bit more specifically and talk about lung volumes. So thanks to our producer director, and thank you so much for joining me.